If tonight's story has a moral, then I guess it is never underestimate the power of the human mind. For it is an incredible thing, its ability to create, to suppress, to surprise. Ah, yes, yes, yes. What a story I have for you this evening, now. You know how fond I am of campfires, so I'm so glad you're here to join me, now. Gather in a bit closer. I've got a story to tell you. And it goes something like this. I'm still in high school and since I'm not quite 16 yet, I don't drive. It doesn't really bother me though, since the town I live in is relatively small, and everywhere I go is pretty much in walking distance. There's this gorgeous wooded area between my school and home that us locals know as Humble Woods. I'm honestly not sure where the name came from, but it isn't found on any maps, as it isn't really that large. It's no actual forest or anything, just about the size of a large park with a walking path winding through the center of it. It gets fairly thick at some sections, but during the day the sun always finds gaps to break through, and it's just one of those serene places where you can feel nature soothe you. At least, this is how I remember it. I don't usually walk the woody path, though, since it takes longer to get between home and school. A couple of months or so ago, I was feeling extremely stressed though, and decided to take my time after school and walk the calm path to try and de-stress myself. I hadn't walked this path in at least four or five years. Why would you want to go that way? It takes longer than our normal way and it creeps me out hardcore. You should just walk with me like usual, my best friend Melissa inquired when I informed her that I would be changing things up one afternoon. We usually walked home together, since we lived only a couple of houses apart. I offered for her to join me, but she insisted that she felt there was something off about the woods, so she wouldn't take part in the relaxing afternoon walk with me. I knew it was going to be weird walking by myself, but with how nervous the woods seemed to make her, I wasn't going to push the issue. The last bell rang out through the school, and I met Melissa at her locker. We walked outside together, and when we got to the point of splitting off to our different routes for the day, she made me promise to let her know when I got home. I watched as she walked through the crosswalk, shooting me a glance over her shoulder before reaching the sidewalk and continuing the main path to our neighborhood. I didn't understand why the woods freaked her out so much. We used to play there all the time as kids. As I walked over to the edge of the woods, I tried to recall if anything had happened back then that would have scared her. Humble Woods was just as I remembered. The trees were tall, strong, and shaded the path just enough that it made the ground comfortably cool. The sun shone between branches and leaves, lighting the way for little animals to scurry about amongst the tree trunks, shrubs, and flowers. A smile spread across my face as I took a deep breath of fresh, piney air and exhaled. By my guesstimation, it would take me around half an hour to get home. The more direct route took about 15 minutes, and with the curves and winding of the wooded trail, it should take at least twice that, I thought. For the first five minutes of my walk, I let my mind wander like the squirrels I saw scampering up tree trunks. Birds sang their songs, melodies that made me think of soft but vibrant colours dancing around. Every now and then I could see one flitter from one tree to another, and at one point I even heard the faint tapping of a woodpecker. I felt at peace for the first time all year. School had been tough this year with my advanced classes, and I'd started a part-time job at a local market. This momentary break from all that 
was exactly what I needed. The gentle sunlight peeking through the treetops washed over me and bathed me in warm serenity. Little did I know, it wouldn't last very long. After those blissful first five minutes or so, I came upon a slightly sparse area to my right. It looked as if there was a tiny clearing just past a handful of trees. I couldn't remember seeing this before, but it had also been quite a while since I was here. Despite the sun shining brightly above me and to the left of the pathway, the clearing looked rather dark, like the light couldn't penetrate the tops of the trees that surrounded it. That's odd. It should be lighter here, I thought. What could keep the sunlight out that much? I slowed my pace as I neared the tree closest to the path, stopping next to it. I couldn't see very far into the clearing, even when I leaned forward, one hand against the bark of the tree. As I stepped one foot off the worn trail, my phone buzzed in my pocket. It startled me slightly, and using my hand on the tree to push slightly, I pulled my foot back and reached for my phone with my other hand. As the hand holding onto the tree let go and brushed slightly against the bark, I felt a stinging sensation and let out an involuntary ow. It was almost the same feeling you get when you slide a piece of paper across your skin and just know you have a paper cut before you even see it. With my phone in my left hand, I brought my right hand to my face. Sure enough, there was a slender cut on my palm, spanning from the base of my middle finger to the base of my pinky. It was a little larger than a paper cut, but still thin enough that I could see blood just barely pushing up to meet the air. I pressed the wound against my pants at thigh level and unlocked the screen of my phone. It was a text from Melissa. Walking home alone is boring. Mom's working late. Can I come over when you get home? I glanced back to the tree where I'd cut myself, but didn't immediately see anything very sharp. Brushing it off, I began typing as I turned back to continue my walk home. Yeah, are you going to eat dinner with us? Melissa responded quickly. Nah, probably not. Mom should be home by then, I think. All right, I'll let you know when I get home. I typed and hit send quickly before locking my screen. Before locking my screen and sliding my phone back in the front pocket of my hoodie. As I continued down the dirt path, I inspected my hand closer. It stung, but it didn't seem like there was anything stuck in it, so I resolved to just wash it when I got home and be done with it. After another few minutes, I'd started to feel uneasy for some reason. It took me a moment, but I finally realized that I could no longer hear anything. No birds were chirping. No animals were scuttling around. No breeze was shifting the leaves. There was nothing. I knew that I hadn't lost my hearing, though, because I could still hear the sound of my feet on the ground with each step that I made. I tried to think of theories as to why this would happen, but none truly fit. Even when there's a storm coming and animals take shelter before it comes down, there are still some noises to be heard. It was eerie, and made me feel vulnerable and alone. I quickened my pace. It had only been a little over ten minutes since I began my short trek through the woods, and I still had a bit of ground to cover. I tried desperately to assure myself that this wasn't weird, but the silence wouldn't allow for that. It was then that I finally realized I was the only person around. Possibly the only person in the woods at all. That didn't make sense. Kids should be running and playing and enjoying the trees and natural hiding places. As a kid, I myself played in these woods. Usually closer to the other side, nearer to my house. They'd always been relaxing and calm. But even still, you could guarantee that you would see at least a couple of kids running among the brush 
and laughing with one another at least once whenever you entered the woods. Had I seen kids or anyone going in or coming out of the forest recently? I couldn't remember now. Another ten minutes passed in mind-twisting quiet. I had to be getting close to the edge of the woods, definitely over halfway at least. From a fair distance, I heard a rustling noise. It was very faint, but after having no noise for so long, it made me jump. I looked around, turning to walk backwards for a moment so I could see behind me, but I saw nothing. I couldn't be sure yet which direction the sound had come from, so I strained my ears in an attempt to hear it again. I turned to face forward once more and heard it. Still hard to hear and off in the distance. It sounded like it was coming from ahead of me, and off to the left. <sighs> it's just an animal. You're finally getting out of the creepy, quiet part of the woods, I thought to myself. As much as I hoped this was really the case, I couldn't deny the chill that began to edge up my spine. There were still no other sounds, and I didn't hear the rustling again. I walked briskly for another two minutes and then came upon something that jolted memories to the front of my mind. There was a treehouse just off the path on the left. I'd totally forgotten about the treehouse. Melissa and I used to play in it all the time. We'd hide out when her brother was picking on her, which meant we were in there quite a bit. It looks smaller now, but when you're a kid... Things tend to look bigger. Without thinking about it, I left the path and walked to stand below the entrance of the wooden structure. The wooden planks nailed to the tree like rungs on a ladder leading up into the branches looked rotted, and some of them were missing chunks out of them. I looked up at the old wooden hideout, walking in a circle around the tree, and saw that it matched the decay of the step. A few boards looked like they hung loosely and would fall off with any strong gust of wind. There were three small windows that were warped and misshapen from years of weather, and sections of the treehouse were slumping down. I remembered that they never had glass in them, and even though, as a kid, I thought it would be perfect if they were like real windows in houses, but now I was glad because surely the glass would have shattered in at least one of them and littered the ground. I saw a few holes here and there from rots and possibly insects. It was in terrible shape. Along with the decay, I saw some deep gashes in the wood littering the surfaces around the window holes and bottom of the treehouse. They were in sets of four and made me think of an animal trying to claw its way up the wood and into the shelter. Maybe a frantic animal made them, trying to get out of a storm or something, I thought to myself brushing off the odd tingle in my spine that the sight caused. Standing back at the entrance, I felt a wave of nostalgia as I gazed up into the hole that served as a doorway into the floor of the house. Tears started gathering in my eyes from nowhere, and I wasn't sure why seeing this old plaything was so heartbreaking. Those thoughts quickly vanished, however, as soon as I saw what was in the treehouse. I hadn't really been focusing on anything while I looked into the darkened room from beneath it, but an ever so slight movement and noise made me realize that, as I was looking up, something was shifting silently around the hole. I couldn't really see it, but I knew something was there. I pretended not to notice and made my way back to the path, pulling out my phone and calling Melissa. Mel, remember that treehouse we used to play in when we were little? I asked once she answered the phone. That old one in the woods without glass in the windows. Her tone resonated with remembrance, albeit a confused remembrance. Yeah, that one. I paused before I continued, silently gathering my courage to put what I felt and saw into words. 
pretty much falling apart. And there, there, there are these weird scratches and stuff on it. What do you mean, scratches? Melissa's tone seemed to jump from calm to nervously curious. I don't know. They're just scratches around the windows and bottom. I'm sure it's no big deal, but I think whatever animal made them might have started living in the treehouse. What kind of animal was it? I can't say. I saw something moving around up in there, but couldn't see what it was or anything. I'm sure it's just my nerves and the unusual route, but I'm a little creeped out, to be honest. I admitted my real reason for calling her. Get out of those woods as soon as you can. Run if you have to. Just get out of them. I'll meet you at the exit. She answered quickly, not even trying to hide the worry and fear in her voice. Why? I didn't think we had... I was cut off by the tone signaling the call being ended. I looked at the screen as her name disappeared. I was confused. I couldn't remember ever hearing about any predators, or even any animals bigger than rabbits in these woods. What could have caused those scratches, though? With Melissa's reaction, I wasn't able to convince myself to stay calm. I was freaked out, and couldn't try to explain it away. The chill that had nestled itself lightly in my spine now ignited, and I felt an icy flood run the length of my spine and shove the feeling of being washed into my head with it. I looked around quickly, still not seeing anything. I quickened my pace once again, but the being watched sensation didn't dissipate. Off in the distance behind me, there was a soft thud. I began to jog, not bothering and not wanting to look back, at least not yet. I strained my ears as I followed the trail, attempting to hear if anything was following. At first, the only thing that resonated in my ears was my own heart beating, and breath becoming heavier and heavier from the sudden physical exertion, and the fear that gripped my chest tightly in its icy grasp. Soon enough, though, I began to hear noises from behind me. It sounded like feet hitting the ground and pushing off again. Leaves were trampled on, branches snapped. Even with all of this, it was still quieter than I would imagine someone chasing me would be. I broke into a sprint, beginning to pant heavily. I was beyond out of shape, but the fear of whatever or whoever was following me overruled my body's protests to continue harder. I focused on the path in front of me wanting desperately to get to the end of the trees. I didn't look behind me until I felt my backpack snag on something. Slowing down quickly, I turned slightly to see what it was caught on, and I nearly collapsed at the sight. Thinking it was an errant branch that had caught me off guard, I wasn't expecting to see the monstrosity that met my eye. My heart had been pounding so loudly in my skull, and this thing was so silent that I had no idea it had even caught up with me. I was face to face with my pursuer. It was gaunt with sickly grey skin that sagged in areas of its body. Where the eyes should have been, there were two deep sunken holes into the skull each with their own beady black eyeball that stared hungrily at me. It stood on two legs, with one bony arm hanging loosely, almost touching the ground, and the other reached out to me with clawed fingers, puncturing and gripping my back. Instead of a nose, there were two holes where nostrils might have been at one time. It was mostly bald, with matted, thin black hair clinging to its skull in spots and hanging down in stringy strands to its shoulders. Every bone on its body seemed to be accentuated by emaciation and it appeared that some bones were close to completely piercing through the skin. 
in a twisted, grotesque way. It looked like it could have once resembled a human, long, long ago. It snarled at me, and I could see the thin lips stretch back unnatural to reveal sharp, jagged, and broken teeth, unlike anything human. They were more like the teeth of an animal, a carnival, and I knew instantly, without having to think about it, what those teeth were meant for, and used to rip flesh and muscle from bone and body. I took all of this in fast, in just a split second, and felt a primal terror well up in me, threatening to choke me and make my lungs explode. I couldn't fight the feeling that it recognized and hated me. Moving rapidly, knowing I had no time to lose, I slipped my right arm out of one strap of my backpack. As I went to toss the bag off my other shoulder, the creature's arm that had previously been hanging down came up in a blur of motion to grab my shoulder. I felt those blackened and dirty claws knife their way into my flesh. I swear, I heard that thing chuckle when I let out an involuntary cry of agony. Using my opposite hand, I pushed the strap of my bag off of my shoulder and onto the arm of that thing. Momentarily, a little thankful, it grabbed me above the strap. The sudden weight made it release its hold on me, and I took off as fast as I could while it dropped my backpack onto the ground from its wrist. The skin on my shoulder felt warm from the blood seeping out and soaking my shirt and sweatshirt. I wasn't sure how bad the damage would be, but I felt the deep pain all the way into my bone. My arm was quickly going numb, and I couldn't move it. I reached my right hand through the front pocket of my hoodie, trying not to drop my phone at the same time, and grabbed my left wrist, pulling it through. It was no sling, but it would keep my arm steady for now, and out of the way. I glanced over my shoulder, and saw the thing resume chase. If it was possible, it seemed angrier, snarling at me when it saw my face turn to look at it. It was following me now on all fours, no longer trying to be quiet. I pushed my feet to move faster, my body to hold out a little longer. With each pounding of my foot against the ground, Memories from when I was nine pounded my head in flashes. Melissa laughing as I chased her between the trees. Me hiding around a large tree waiting for her to find me. The two of us sitting in the treehouse. The odd noise, like a cooing and a whimper at the same time. Us looking out of each window and seeing nothing. Me following Melissa down the steps. The noise sounding again. Melissa running off excitedly to follow it. Me yelling for her to wait up. Jogging through the trees, trying to find her. Calling her name. Melissa's shrill scream piercing the air and assaulting my ears. Me running in the direction her scream had resonated from. Almost physically running into her. Melissa's dirt-smeared and tear-stricken face, and she sobbed, the sheer terror I saw in her eyes. Her standing there, glancing behind her while she held one of her shoes in her hand. Her grabbing my arm and pulling me back to the path as she told me we had to get out of the woods. The sounds the pursuer made that let us know it was gaining on both of us breaking out in the fastest speed I have ever run in my life. The strange, slow motion moment when I turned around because she'd stumbled. The way she yelled at me to run faster, to go, to keep running. The way I heard heavy thuds against the ground as the monster came into sight. 
the grotesque way it salivated and ran on all fours in a gait that seemed too fast for the way its arms and legs bent. The claws, digging in and spitting up dirt as they scraped into the earth and then back out. The air burning in my lungs as I screamed Melissa's name. The way she turned her head, saw it, then turned back to me and yelled at me for the last time to run. I remembered the blood I saw mixed with dirt and caked on her arm in three long gashes running from her shoulder to her elbow. I remembered hearing my steps pounding in my head along with my heart. I remembered hearing her steps not far behind me and the creature's steps still gaining on us. I remembered seeing the edge of the trees come into view and thinking that we just had to get out of the woods and things would be okay. I remembered thinking that we had almost made it. In my mind, I saw myself as a child lunging my body into the bright sun, out of the oppression of the trees. I turned round to look at Melissa when I was about ten feet out of the trees. I saw the monster right behind her, using its back legs to pounce at her. Claws sunk into the flesh of her shoulders and she screamed again. I remembered the ringing in my ears caused from the combination of her scream and my own as I screamed her name desperately. I saw the monster grip tight enough to make blood spurt out of a tiny bit from around the claws it had deep in her. I remembered how I had made a move to run back in after my best friend, but was stopped suddenly by two strong arms grabbing my waist. I remembered my father holding me tight as I fought to go save the girl I was supposed to keep growing up with. I remembered seeing her father clutching a shotgun as he ran at full speed into the shaded woods and after his daughter. I remembered the way I felt my body give out as I sobbed uncontrollably when my mum appeared, taking me from my father and the way I couldn't feel the ground slam into my knees as I collapsed. Flashes kept coming of my mum kneeling next to me, then sitting completely on the ground. She cradled me in her lap, her arms wrapped around me tight as I screamed and cried. My father had run back into the house to grab his own gun, and he sped past us to join Melissa's father in the woods. With my vision blurred by these flashes, and hot tears stinging my eyes, I pushed my feet hard into the dirt, running faster than I had in all those years. In the distance, I saw sunlight growing brighter, and knew I was almost there. I could hear the monster right behind me. I thought I could feel its hot breath invading the space behind my neck. I kept running. The moment I saw the edge of the trees, and I knew I would be safe. I felt a tug on the hood of my sweatshirt. I faltered for just a second as I realized the thing had grabbed at me again. I would discover later that it ripped through the fabric of my hoodie, leaving the hood hanging in several pieces. I knew I couldn't stop though. Even though I felt a crippling, choking sensation from the front of my sweatshirt slamming into my throat, I kept running. As I pushed through the final trees and into the open, I felt as if I'd just pushed through an invisible barrier separating safety from horror. I didn't stop running until I was at least 15 feet away and hadn't heard the steps behind me. I slowed and turned around, catching what I hope will be the last glimpse of the creature that I will ever see. Its face was contorted in that hideous snarl, peeking out from behind a tree. 
One hand with those sharpened hooks held the bark of the tree it was behind. I'm not sure how long we stood there, staring at each other. For some reason, it couldn't come out into the open, and I was relieved. I was safe. I was panting heavily as those dark eyes bore into me, wishing they could be seeing my inside. I heard a noise from behind me and whipped my head around to see Melissa standing there. I turned to face her, stealing a final look back over my shoulder to where the beast had stood. It was no longer there, having retreated into the trees once again. When I looked at her again, her sixteen-year-old self had changed into a vision of her when she was nine, the day she was taken. Her expression was one of heart-wrenching sadness. I felt the tears begin to stream down my face uncontrollably as I dropped to my knees. I wanted to talk, to say her name, to say I was sorry for living my life as if she hadn't gone. I couldn't manage any words, though, but it seemed like none were needed. Melissa smiled sadly at me and walked to where I was kneeling. She kneeled down in front of me and touched my cheek lightly with her fingertips. I felt a slight tingle where they touched, but couldn't feel the touch as if she had been really flesh and blood. She took my right hand in her left and held it, palm up. I saw now that her right hand was clenched around something. She gently placed something smooth and cool in my palm, and used her own to wrap my fingers around it. She stood, still smiling sorrowfully, and kissed my forehead. Without any words spoken out loud, I felt her whisper into my mind that she was glad I made it out of those woods, those years ago, and now. With that... She turned and started walking away. I saw the image of her father standing patiently in the direction of their house. She walked calmly up to him as he beamed with happiness. He picked her up in his arms and they both looked at me with smiles that I would never see again in my life. The thought of this made the tears flow harder for a moment. I watched as they turned around and began losing their solidity with each step. They faded into nothing, and I was left there, hurting both physically and in my heart. I bent my head to the ground and let myself cry, until I heard footsteps approaching me. I looked up to see my father. His face showed a parent's worry, but his eyes looked upon me softly. He held his hand out to help me up. I walked through the woods. I spoke in a broken voice before he could ask anything. He swept me into his arms in a tight hug. I winced slightly at the pressure the hug put on my torn up shoulder, but the pain was worth it to feel safe. Are you okay? is all he asked as he released me. His worried expression took on a note of horror when he saw the blood transferred onto him from my shoulder. I looked up at him and held my clenched hand out in front of me. His gaze fell upon my hand as I unfurled my fingers to reveal to both of us a small, half-heart pendant on a silver chain. It had a cursive M engraved on it. I looked back up at him new tears pushing their way to the surface, and he only looked at me, a sad smile of his own forming on his face. He took the necklace from my hand and reached it around my neck, clasping it in place. It fell at the same length of my own half-heart necklace, and I touched the now complete heart with the initials M and J. Let's go home, Jenna. We need to take a look at that shoulder, and you need to rest. And with that, I let him lead me home, holding my hand in his as we had done so long ago when I was still a little girl.
girl. In the couple of months since this happened, I've struggled with trying to understand it all. Especially how she was alive for me for almost seven years. My parents explained to me that after our fathers went in after her, Melissa's father found her body being ripped apart by that thing. He'd shot at it, and it ran off. He had run over to his daughter, dropping his gun at some point, and when my father found them, he was covered in her blood as he cradled her dead body and sobbed. Before my father could reach him, he was knocked down, hitting his head on a large root, and he was out cold for a few hours. When he came to, the body of Melissa was gone, along with her father. The only sign of them was a smeared trail of blood where the monster had dragged them on the ground. My father had followed the trail as far as he could until it disappeared. Then he had to return home. He said he knew from the amount of blood there was on the ground, around the area and on the trail, there was no way Melissa's father could still be alive. No one ever saw him again. Melissa's mom went to a mental institution after having a severe breakdown, and I was catatonic for a week after the incident. I still don't remember that section of time, but apparently I wouldn't talk. I would barely eat. I would have nightmares every night and wouldn't get any rest. Finally, after talking to a doctor, my parents slipped me a sedative so I would sleep. I slept the majority of two days, and when I woke up, I had forgotten the entire ordeal. I pretended Melissa was still alive. I pretended to play with her. I talked about her and acted like she was still around. My parents didn't want to break my heart all over again, so they let me have my imaginary Melissa, hoping one day I would grow out of it. When I didn't, for years. They started wondering how to handle it, and had been discussing what to do about it when I decided to take my walk in the woods. Even still, I don't know for sure what the Melissa I grew up with was, or she made up by my mind to help me cope with what had happened. Was she a ghost, sticking around because she couldn't let go, or because I couldn't let go? Either way, how is it that she gave me her necklace? She had been wearing it that day, and the bodies of both her and her father still have never been found. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>